Hey folks, Quillate Dean here, and welcome to a character creation video for Pillars of Eternity. I've already made one video where I looked at some of the gameplay mechanics, you know, how combat works, how armor works, how weapons work, what the different stats do, that sort of thing. We will be referencing some of those things in here, but if you're confused, you may want to check out the other video uh, for some extra details in there. So in this video, we're just going to be going through the different character races and classes and talking about some of the different ones. I put about four hours into the game. I haven't tried to, you know, spoiler myself too much yet. We will be doing an actual Let's Play of this game relatively soon um, probably right after this video goes online actually will be the let's play videos um, but in this video we're just gonna be looking at the different race and class options uh, when you go new game you do get to pick a difficulty setting as well as have two extra options to go on here so we've got easy normal hard and stupid hard one of the things to note about stupid hard is if you start a game with this you can't lower the difficulty afterwards you are locked on path of the damned which is crazy additionally there's this trial of iron option which makes it so there's only one save file for the whole playthrough and if your main character dies the save file is deleted which is just brutally awesome um especially when combined with something like path of the damned where you can't lower the difficulty either there's also this expert mode here, expert mode by toggling that on. There's a bunch of things here that give you some additional help in game, you know, like a, an, a, a, an area, when you're using area effect spells like a fireball, uh, with this turned on, it'll show you exactly where that fireball will hit. If you're in expert mode, it turns all of that stuff off. Um, so I'm going to be going ahead and just going into, say, normal, non-trial of iron, whoops, <clears throat> non-expert mode to do this. That'll probably be what my Let's Play is as well, just because I'm not a masochist when it comes to videos. I might go and make a much harder game uh, play when uh, for my own playthrough, but I'm going to skip this little cutscene, this intro here. We're going to be looking at some of that more once we get into the uh, an actual Let's Play. There shouldn't really be any spoilers in this Five video. Um, we're going to skip past that right away as well. There really shouldn't be much in the way of spoilers, but, you know, warning, every now and again, there, there might be something that slips out. Okay. So, first of all, so this is the character creation screen. Uh, these tabs over here will show us basically all the little bits that we will go through from start to finish. If you've ever played any Infinity Engine games like Baldur's Gate, Icewind Gale, Dale, uh, Planescape Torment, a lot of this will seem familiar. And of course, there's a good reason for that. This game is made by basically the same people who made those games. And they specifically, um, they actually did a Kickstarter for this to basically make a game that is very similar to those Infinity Infinity Engine games, and um, yeah, I'd say they did a pretty good job. Okay, gender, male, female, no difference in terms of stats or anything like that. There might be some different uh, reactions in game depending on what situation you're in, but you know we have our choice there. Let's let's make a dude here. Um, races. Okay, so there are six races available in the game: human, Omawa. Oh man, I better not make one of these because I'm not going to be able to pronounce them. Dwarf, Elf, Orlin, which, you know, sort of, kind of, hobbity ferrets or something, I'm not sure. And these godlikes, uh, which are kind of very, very weird. Um, we're going to look at them a little bit more. What's worth noting is for every race, there are also some subtypes. So as human, we choose metafolk, ocean folk, savannah folk, um, omawa, we choose coastal or island. They're sort of aquatic people. You can read some of their history there. If you want to pause, you can read that. Also, I believe most of their backstory is available on the wikis and the websites. Dwarves, you can choose mountain and boreal, and so on and so forth. Now, some of these have different kind of traits. So let's talk about some of their mechanics. As a human, you start with plus one to resolve, which gives you better will and deflection defenses, as well as gives you more concentration, which makes it harder for you to be interrupted. You also start with plus one might, which is increases the amount of damage and healing you do from all effects. So whether you're going to be a fighter or a wizard, you might want some more might. And in fact, if you're going to be a healing priest, might is not bad for you either because it increases the amount you heal. Also boosts your... Um, your fortitude defense. As a human, all three subtypes, at least in this pre-release version that I'm playing, have exactly the same special ability, which is to say once per fight, um, if they uh, drop below 50% endurance, they will get a boost to accuracy and damage. Um, endurance is your hit points in the fight. So uh, if you looked at my mechanic videos, you will know you have both health and endurance. The endurance is about maybe a quarter of what the health is. Every time you take damage in a fight, you lose both endurance and health. If you run out of endurance, you fall 
unconscious and you're basically out of the fight. If you run out of health, you're basically dead, which is why you have four times as much health as endurance. Um, there's quite a few things that can boost your, your endurance, can recover your endurance. Most healing actually just recovers your endurance, for example. And as far as your health, basically the only way to recover it is to actually rest and camp for the night. So endurance is how much damage you can take in a single battle. Health is how much damage you can take before you have to stop and actually rest, for example because your endurance comes back at the end of every fight. So Fighting Spirit, every time they drop below half their endurance, they get a boost to their accuracy and damage. So the only difference here is your backstory and how it might affect your interaction with different characters. Um, these are seagoing creatures. They start, or characters, I don't know, race. They start with plus two might. Very, very powerful, very potent that way. And your two variants actually do have a difference. If you're a coastal one, you get Towering Physique which means you have a bonus to defense against being knocked prone, which is, you know, falling down on your butt, and stun effects. With the island variant, you start with an additional weapon set. Weapon sets in-game, during combat, you can't really take equipment on and off, for example. However, you can have more than one weapon set defined. I think most characters start with two, um, so they can swap, say, between, say, sword and shield, and maybe they have a bow right? So you can swap between those two weapon sets. Also, I think most characters will also have the option of uh, going to unarmed mode if they want. As the island Omawa, you uh, get an additional weapon set. So maybe you can switch between having, say, uh, a sword for slashing damage, maybe a warhammer for bludgeoning or crushing damage, and then maybe you'll also want a bow for range stuff, plus that does piercing damage, for example. So you've got some real options there, especially late in the game when there's more resistances that you're trying to work your way around. Um, that might become very valuable. So as a dwarf, you start with plus two might, just like these guys, so very, very good. Um, but they get a penalty to dexterity in exchange for a bonus to constitution. So dexterity affects your action speed primarily, as well as your reflex defense. So it's going to be a little bit harder to make a dwarf that can attack really, really fast, but he's going to be um, a really good damage or healer, a damager or healer, I guess you could say, and he will have a little bit extra hit points from having a higher constitution. The mountain variant is even more resistant to poison and disease, which they'll already get a pretty big bonus to with their might and constitution, because both of those things increase their fortitude defense, which is what poison and disease tends to target. The Boreal Dwarf version is different. They get a plus 15 accuracy bonus against creatures of the wilder or primordial type. I haven't played enough to really be able to tell you definitively what those types are, but I can tell you that a plus 15 accuracy bonus is pretty substantial. Uh, basically, because the die roll is from 1 to 100, a plus 15 accuracy bonus will effectively give you another 15% chance to hit, um, which means for every out of every 20 attacks, three misses will turn into a hit, R roughly. I mean, you know, it's, it's fuzzier than that, but that's that's a very substantial boost, very, very good. As an elf, bonus to dexterity, which increases your action speed and reflexes, and a bonus to perception, which gives you a higher chance to interrupt opponents when you hit them, as well as a bonus to deflection, which is, deflection is your not getting hit from direct attack defense, as well as reflex defense, which is good against things like fireballs, for example. Um, and then they come with two variants, the wood elves, which get a distant advantage against any enemy that is more than four meters away. Four meters is not that far, so it's going to be pretty easy to get. Wood elves gain a bonus to accuracy, deflection, and reflexes. So wood elf is ideal for an archer because you're going to be way more accurate and you'll also be harder to hit, which is really nice. As a pale elf, you get elemental endurance, which increases your uh, resistance or your damage reduction against burn and freeze. So anything that hits you with fire or ice, you will take less damage, which is nice. As an Orlin thingy, whatever this is, you get the plus one to resolve, which makes it uh, improves your concentration, which um, makes it harder for you to be interrupted, as well as your will and deflection defenses. You do get a penalty to might, so you do a little bit less damage, but you've got plus two bonus to perception, which increases your ability to interrupt people, as well as giving you a uh, bonus to your deflection and reflexes. So, um, you know, I, it's hard to tell what this is really optimized to be. Although, I gotta say, it's very tempting to make a character with very high dexterity, so you have a very fast attack rate, and a lot of perception, so you have a very high interrupt chance, and just use this character to try to lock down other enemies, in particular to have them target spellcasters. That works equally as well if you're in melee or if you're doing range attacks, for example. You do come with two variants, the Hearth Orlin, Minor Threat. When attacking any target that is also being targeted by a teammate, uh, Hearth Orlins convert some of their hits into crits. You get 
more crits. It doesn't tell you what the rate is here, but it's pretty good. A critical hit will do 25% more damage and increases the duration of effects by 50%, which is pretty cool. Even spells can crit. For example, um, there's a charm spell that I was using with uh, the Cypher class, and it crit once, and I had someone mind-controlled for like it, well over the duration of the, the fight. It was awesome. The wild variants have Defiant Resolve. After being subjected to a will attack, so anything that attacks sort of the mind, Wild Orleans temporarily gain a bonus to all defenses. So whether, I believe, I'm not sure, being subjected, I suspect that whether the will attack hits or not, they'll get a boost to their defenses. So they're a little bit tougher there. Uh, and then finally you got these godlikes, which are a little bit bizarre. So you've got plus one to dexterity and plus one to intellect. So like many of the other people, you end up with plus two to a stat. Some have a minus and a plus one, but ultimately I believe all the races end up with a net plus two to stats. So the godlikes have that as well. However, because they have weird heads, they can never wear a helmet, which is weird. On the other hand, their um, racial abilities are pretty potent. Um, the, the death variant here... When death godlike attacks an enemy with 15% or less endurance, so when they're just about, when they're near death, the death godlike actually makes, does more damage. Now, early on, when you're fighting squishy things, that might not matter so much, but if you're fighting a big bad boss, that last 15% might actually last a fair deal of time, so getting the bonus damage is quite cool. The fire godlike over here, I like potentially more than anything else. When reduced below 50% endurance, so when you're in combat hit points are less than half, Fire Godlike glow like metal in a forge, gaining damage reduction and doing a small amount of fire damage to any creature who hits them in melee. Which is awesome! I think that makes them a really good potential sort of tank, frontline fighter kind of thing, both because they're most likely to trigger this, because they'll probably take damage, but also because the damage reduction will be more valuable for them, and probably enemies are hitting them in melee, which means they'll take fire damage, which is cool. The moon godlikes look really awesome. You can change their heads, by the way. There's quite a bit of variety um, in the godlikes. So they get silver tide. Every time their endurance drops below 75, then 50, then 25, every time one of those things triggers, they will generate waves of healing moonlight that restore endurance to them and their allies. So basically, every time they, got, they take a little bit of damage, um, they're going to put out a burst of healing for your entire party, which is pretty awesome. Then the nature godlikes over here. They get a bonus when, again, when their endurance is below 50%, they get a bonus to their might, constitution, and dexterity. So the constitution actually, in a sense, gives them a little bit more hit points, and more importantly, all these things also improve their fortitude defense and some of their deflection and reflex as well. But they actually start to hit harder. They hit faster and harder when they're below 50% health. So quite cool. Is it worth giving up a helmet? Well, I've only played the very beginning of the game. So far, the helmets are purely cosmetic, but I'm sure there will be some helmets later on that have some pretty powerful bonuses. Um, so, you know, maybe you're giving up a lot. I, I have no idea. So those are the races. We'll use a human as sort of a baseline over here as we go forward into the others. Oh, what I should do, actually, is look at the female forms of all the races as well. And, of course, you can tune the, the different heads to make them look different as well. Um, so that's the human. There's the Amawa, the dwarf. No, no beard. The elf. The Orlin and the Godlikes. And the Godlikes are worth checking out. So the Death Godlike, Fire, Moon, and Nature. And again, once we get into appearance later on, um, especially with the Godlikes, you can change their heads pretty dramatically. I think it'll keep defaulting to the same one here, though. All right, so again, I'll use a baseline human to go forward from there, and we'll take a look. So um, again, with the humans, all three of the variants in the build I have have exactly the same ability, and it's a good one. We'll just pick Metafolk since it doesn't matter. Although, I don't remember, does this change? Oh yeah, it changes some of their base look, but you can still tune quite a bit. All right, the 11 classes. Lots to talk about over here. Um, so, Barbarian, Fighter, and Paladin are your standard, stereotypical sort of melee fighters. Although, there's no reason they have to be melee. They can absolutely be ranged fighters, if you want. Um, the Barbarian looks kind of cool and badass. You'll notice here all the classes have a certain base endurance, health, accuracy, and deflection. Again, health, is, or endurance is your, your more normal hit points. Endurance is what you're mostly going to be concerned about hit point wise, because when you run out of endurance, you fall down in battle and you're no longer helping out. Health is your, um, is much higher than endurance. When you run out of health, you are dead. Generally speaking, you won't run out of health in a single fight. You're just going to be forced to camp at a certain point. So see, the Barbarian gets a very high endurance and health. Average accuracy, low deflection. L deflection is uh, their ability to just avoid an attack altogether. So they do have a lot of hit points, but they're not very good at um, avoiding combat. Whereas if you compare the fighter, they have high endurance and health instead of very high. But they start with 
more base deflection. Um, also, I think more accuracy. And then the Paladin, um, they have somewhat lower stuff here, although still decent deflection. They have other abilities going on. So anyway, Barbarian, the thing is, again, because you can equip um, any weapon and any armor on any character, some of these classes, depending on exactly how you build your character, might, you know, could feel the same way. You could end up, start with a Barbarian or a Fighter, but still ultimately end up with a relatively similar character. Um, there's a few differences in that they do start with a special ability. The Barbarian starts with a Carnage ability. Whenever they hit with a melee attack, they also make, they, they splash damage. They hit other nearby enemies um, at the same time whenever they hit, which is very cool. So they start with this ability. Additionally, if I hit next over here, you can see the Barbarian can choose an additional starting ability, either friend, or Frenzy, which they can use one per, once per fight. If they turn that on, they get plus four to their might and constitution, so they hit a lot harder and they're a little bit tougher. Um, they also attack faster, 33% faster while they're frenzying, which is really good, but they lose some of their uh, defenses, their deflection, and you can't actually see their health or endurance during that time, so you don't know how badly hurt they're necessarily getting, which is kind of neat. And also take the Barbaric Yell over here, which does an area of effect Frightened. And again, if you watch my mechanic video, you know that Intellect will increase the size of an AoE, of an area of effect, and increase the duration. So you could make a Barbarian, for example, with high intellect that focuses in things like Barbaric Yell, and all of a sudden your area of effect for your Yell would be gargantuan. Here you can see it's got a base of 5 meters, but if I have an intellect higher than 10, this effective, this actual radius will increase by quite a bit. And same thing for the duration. It can uh, be quite a bit longer than 12 seconds. 12 seconds is a long time in combat. Um, again, in the, if you watch the mechanic videos, you know that a standard single weapon, whether you're using a one-handed weapon or a two-handed weapon will basically hit once every three seconds. If you're dual wielding, then you'll hit twice every four seconds, but if you're dual wielding fast weapons, you can get to the point where you hit like twice every 2.6 seconds or something like that. So 12 seconds is, is quite a lot of time. Now, Frightened doesn't mean that people run away. Frightened just reduces the resolve and dexterity and their accuracy, so they're much less likely to hit you. They're also slightly more vulnerable to being hit while being frightened. But um, it's possible that you will unlock more of these abilities. When you level up, sometimes you will unlock more talents. Some of them are class specific. Like you get to pick and choose. When you get a free talent, an, an extra talent, you get to pick and choose what you want from a list of things, some of which are class specific, some of which are available to everyone. For example, everyone can take um, a talent that makes them, I think it's called soldier weaponry or something like that, which makes them better with axes, swords, and some other weapon. I don't remember what it's called. So you could take that, but maybe there's more yells. So again, that sort of intellect-based barbarian might actually be a way to go. Um, so that's uh, so that's the barbarian. So you've got those sorts of things. Let, let's just go down the list one at a time, and we'll check out the base abilities of each class, um, and as well as what kind of variants might be available. So Cypher is sort of a, a psionic caster type person. That's a little bit odd. Uh, they feel a little bit roguish. Um, it, I know, it's hard to describe. So they're, they're a spellcaster. They're psionic, like, mine hunters kind of thing. Um, they, don't use, they don't use mana. They don't have, like, a limited number of castings per day or anything like that. Instead, what they have um, is to start with this thing called Soul Whip. This is just something that's on automatically. Every time they hit someone, either with a melee attack or a ranged attack, um, but, you know, a weapon attack. Anytime they hit someone with a weapon attack, they gain a little bit of focus, and then they can use the focus to cast an ability. For example, one of the ones I like a lot is Whisper of Treason. It costs 10 focus. I think you get two focus every time you hit. Maybe one, I'm not sure. Um, Whisper of Treason requires 10 focus. That's more than one. It must be two per hit. Um, that mind controls someone for 10 seconds. They become charmed. They will fight on your side. They do have, um, they do get, take a penalty to their speed, accuracy, and defense while they're charmed, but they will fight on your behalf. So you can mind control someone for 10 seconds. And again, um, you can crit with this. I critted with this and had someone mind controlled for well over 20 seconds, which was amazing because I had high intellect. So it's a base of 10 but with a high intellect. That number goes up quite a bit. And if you crit, it goes even higher. Um, so it targets their will defense. So again, if you see someone who's got a poor will defense and you're like, I'll use Whispers of Treason, mind control one of them. It actually has a bonus to accuracy, which is really good. Um, I also quite liked Mind Wave. Yeah, so you, you, it's a bit complicated here. But what happens is you target a person. It hits them. 
So right here, it hits them for a um, certain amount of damage directly, and again, targets their will. But then behind that person, it does like a cone-shaped area of effect that can hit people behind them and knock them over. It doesn't do any damage to people behind them, but it can knock them over for, again, a base of three seconds, but this can be um, boosted with your intellect, which most likely will be the case. Might will boost the damage, intellect will boost the size of the area as well as the duration of these effects. So there's a bunch of different sort of ideas. This also requires 10 focus, and there's higher level variants as well. So as a cipher, uh, you spend time attacking people, and then when you get enough focus, you unleash some sort of ability. I really love the mind control. It's really, really, really quite nice. Um, I think you're, because of the way that focus is gained, I think you're heavily incentivized to use a fast attack, but at the same time, because you're quite squishy, uh, ranged ones are pretty good. So I tended to alternate between like twin daggers and uh, like a short bow or something like that, um, depending on the situation to do that. You also start with a little bit of skill. We're going to talk about skills relatively soon. I realized I didn't actually cover this in my, um, in my mechanics um, video, which is a little bit derpy, but we'll, we'll follow those later on. I think there's six different skills. Um, they're all pretty useful for both things, not, not in combat necessarily, but you know, when questing, there's, there's game mechanical, um, effects from them, but there's also a lot of conversation mechanics that use these things quite a bit. Okay. So fighter, standard fighter type person. One thing that's notable is they get a built-in ability called constant recovery. They're always regenerating endurance during combat. They're always um, gaining hit points. They're, they're in combat hit points. They're recovering that constantly. So they, they're very good at being tanky because they can recover a lot of damage. They also have base, the decent high hit points as well as decent deflection built in. And you can start with one of two abilities. Again, you'll unlock more of these as you go forward. You can take the knockdown ability, which you can use twice in every fight, which allows you to knock someone over for five seconds, um, which is quite cool. It doesn't do much damage when it hits them. Um, but it does knock them down, which is pretty good, and that's a pretty decent time to be knocked on your ass. Uh, when you get to the rogue, you'll see the rogue can do, like, bonus sneak attack damage against people who are disabled in a variety of ways, including, I believe, prone. Also have Discipline Barrage, which you can use one for, once per fight, but for 15 seconds, you'll get plus 10 accuracy, which is quite a bit. And again, if you have a high intellect, that could potentially boost that up. I, I'm, I think you're less likely to make a high intellect fighter, um, but again, I don't know a lot of the later abilities. Maybe it's, you know, completely viable. Paladin. Okay, Paladins are very interesting. There's a big chunk of text here we're going to talk about in a second. Decent hit points, decent defenses, decent frontline fighter. They also have a lot of auras and things that you can use to increase your, your party. But before I talk about this faith and conviction, let me go to the next page over here. So as a Paladin, you have to start by choosing an order. Um, and each one of these has a slight difference in what... Actually, I'm wrong. These stats are all the same. Um, they have a slight difference in what dispositions they like. So there's no alignment in this game. There's not sort of good versus evil. However, there are a series of these dispositions which you develop through your conversations. So um, you can see here, passionate, clever, cruel, and stoic are some options. Um, these are things they like and things they don't like for their class. There's also benevolent, diplomatic, um, actually, that might be it. There might be six. I don't remember. And they're opposed to one another. Um, I think passionate is opposed by stoic. Clever. Actually, maybe clever and cruel are opposed. No, cruel must be opposed by benevolent. And then there's aggressive. It's cruel, aggressive, benevolent, diplomatic. So they're all there. Some, some of them are opposed. I can't remember exactly what opposes what. But these, these develop in conversations. Now, normally... Um, that can be hidden, or you can hit a, an option so that when you're in a, um, a conversation, you'll be able to see if, you know, one of the responses might improve one of these sort of dispositions. So as a paladin, but also as a priest, your order sort of encourages you to go in a certain direction. And as your paladin, your ability, right over here, your faith and conviction ability, which boosts um, defenses of yourself, um scales based on how well you're aligned with your disposition from your order. So as a paladin or as a priest, you're incentivized to play your character that follows your religion properly, for example, uh, which is kind of neat. So we've got that. I don't think... Oh yeah, then you've got an ability to choose from as well. Flames of Devotion, once per encounter, does double damage as burn. So you hit someone, so you get full attack, so you do your normal damage, um, plus you do an extra doubling of that damage as burn, which is quite cool. You can also get the Lay on Hands, which allows you to heal an allied target. These, I think, do scale um, as the game goes on or with your stats or something like that. So we did see, um, if you watch my mechanic video, my um, 
my druid character, which I don't think had any particular boost to constitution, I think had about 34 or 35 endurance. So this is almost the equivalent of a full heal in combat. Pretty potent once per encounter. Also has a slight amount of range, so you don't literally have to touch them. Um, so we've got that. Okay. Ranger is up next. This is actually one I haven't even loaded in game yet. I know you do start with an animal companion, um, which apparently don't do much damage, but have very high damage reduction. So they are very, very tanky, apparently. Um, you do have, personally, you have very low endurance, but high health, which is interesting, right? A lot of times you sort of saw them hand in hand. So the Ranger can't necessarily take a lot of punishment in a single fight, but can go for a fair amount of time before having to rest again, which is cool. Also, very high accuracy, which is nice. Um... A couple abilities we can choose from, Wounding Shot over here, you can use twice per encounter, range of 6 meters, which is a pretty good range in combat. Um, you hit them, it does damage, plus damage over time, which is nice, and hobbles them, which reduces their dexterity and movement and reflexes, which is quite a bit. 10 seconds is a pretty decent duration, and again, it combos well with a rogue that can sneak attack people who are hobbled, for example, as well as like lots of other traits. You can also mark a prey. Once per encounter, you can mark a foe for 30 seconds, which is basically going to be the entirety of the fight. And apparently your animal companion gets a damage bonus against mark targets. I haven't explored this mechanic, so I can't really comment on it anymore. We can see there's, there's a list of different companions available, like a lion, which is pretty cool. Um, lion companions have the ability to terrify enemies with a powerful roar. Uh, the boar does bonus damage when they're below 50%. Uh, the bear has even higher damage reduction than normal, for example, so they're quite tough, and so on and so forth. So you might want to tune things. Plus, you know, you might just want to pick what uh, what you think is the coolest. I think that's... Uh... Oh, you name your animal companion! That's great. We're not going to name it. We're just going to back up... Um back up to the class selection thank you very much okay wizard next wizard is your most standardy kind of caster um historically speaking um lots of text going on here with spells and, and whatnot you know low hit points low accuracy low deflection they are not the sort of person who wants to get into hand-to-hand -hand combat ever What's interesting about the wizards, wizards have a grimoire, a spell book. I should actually load a game with a wizard that might highlight it more. Your grimoire, so you can know spells. You're going to start off by knowing four spells, okay? These four spells. You can learn more spells, so it's possible, ultimately, in the game. You might learn every single level one spell that's here, for example. However, your grimoire, your spell book, can only contain four spells of each level, and you can only cast spells in combat that in your, are in your grimoire. So... When, when we play here, I don't know what the numbers might be, but we might do something like when we start, we might have the ability to cast three level one spells before we have to rest again, okay? Now, you can cast any of the spells that are currently in your grimoire, any of your level one spells. So I could cast um, Eldritch Aim three times in a row, or I could go one, one, and one. Like, I get to mix and match exactly how I cast the spells, but I can only cast the ones that are in my grimoire. I can change what spells are in my grimoire, not in the middle of combat, but in between fights, I can change what spells are there. Not only that, but I can carry more than one spell book. I can carry more than one grimoire. I can change them in combat as well. I think it's like a quite a long time to switch. It's like a second and a half, which is which is a pretty substantial amount of time. Although spell casting is pretty slow. The default casting time for a spell, um, if it says if it says average, I believe the casting time for a spell is three seconds to cast, followed by three seconds of recovery. Some of these things are fast, this Eldritch Aim one is fast. I think that would bring it down to two seconds to cast and two seconds to recover, but I actually don't know that for a fact. Um, there is no multi-classing, by the way. If you're looking at this Eldritch Aim and you're like, oh, I can multi-class um, my wizard with something else, you can't do that. However, again, any character can use any equipment, basically. So you could certainly make an archer wizard that uses Eldritch Aim and then, you know, fills people with arrows. That is totally fine. You can do that. So, and you can switch Grimoire, so you can have, like, specialized ones. Um, like, you could have one that's just filled with, like, all fire spells. So if you run into someone who's particularly vulnerable to fire, you just take a second and a half to swap books. I think it's a second and a half to swap books to your all fire damage all the time kind of book, for example. Uh, which is kind of a neat mechanic. Um, I think that's all that can be said about those. Lots of different types of spells. I really like these minor missiles. Um... Fast cast time, which is really nice and sexy. Um, they never, they hardly ever, like, if they interrupt, it's such a small, small period of time. Although, 
even if it's a very tiny interrupt, if they were in the process of casting a spell or they're doing a weapon swing, they actually have to restart it from scratch. So it's not a very long stun, but it can still force people to restart their attack if it hits them at the right time. And this actually does decent damage. You can scale up the damage with might. Again, as a wizard, you might still want might because it increases your damage. But on the other hand, as a wizard, you have a lot of things with duration and area effect, which gets boosted with your intellect, for example. You might just want, when you get to your stat making for your wizard, over here you could like if you want to be like the full out glass cannon you could just do this sort of build for example we're going to talk about these attributes a little bit more you'll notice that unlike other systems the point cost does not increase as you go up and that's because everything has a completely linear growth um, there's no like break points um, going from a 17 to 18 is effectively the same as going from a 10 to 11. Um, every point of intellect gives you an extra six percent to your aoe and an extra five percent duration for example and, you know, plus one to your will defense. Um, so that's why the point cost is relatively flat. If you did this, you would be a monstrously powerful wizard, but on the other hand, your hit points would suffer. You don't have your dexterity bonus for more action speed, um, and, and so on and so forth. So it's quite interesting to pick and choose. All right, Chanter. This is another sort of an oddball class like the Cypher that you might not be used to. Cypher, or the Chanter might be, you know, classically sort of a scald, bard type person. Um, they have these phrases and chants, and it's a really, really neat mechanic. So if we skip to the next one, you can see here they're relatively squishy, um, although they have good deflection, which is nice. So you have phrases. To start off with, you choose two phrases, and these are things you will constantly sing back and forth. So let's say we took, um, blessed was when grid quickest of his tribe, okay? This gives your allies a boost to their movement speed and their reflex defense. And then if we take, say, dull the edge, blunt the point, this is a faux aura, which decreases their slashing and piercing damage by 10%, basically. They're, they're losing 10% of their slashing and piercing. And what will happen is you will, by default, you can make these chants. Eventually, you can unlock more of these. But once you're in the game, you can actually, like, sort of set up your phrases. What are you going to sing in what order? And your character, you can still be attacking. You can still do whatever you want. While you're in combat doing, you know, normal stuff, you will keep singing these songs, alternating back and forth by default. So what would happen here is we would sing, Blessed was Wingrow or whatever, we would sing it for four seconds. Then we would start singing Dull the Edge, Blunt the Point for four seconds. You'll notice they have a linger though. So even after I'm done singing this line and I go back to the first line, for that two extra seconds, this faux aura will still be there because you can see the faux aura actually lasts for six seconds. So there's gonna be a little bit of overlap. So we've got uh, some cool abilities here. So again, faster movement, reflex bonus. This one here is the, um, your enemies do less damage. Thick grew their tongue, stumbling over words, gives them a concentration penalty here, which makes it a lot easier to interrupt people. That's kind of cool. I like this one a lot. Come, come, soft winds of death, which does damage over time. They will lose um, four, four hit points, basically, over the course of six seconds while you sing this line. So this will keep repeating as you're in combat. If the combat lasts for, I don't know, 24 seconds, they will have lost four times as much. Well, it, they sing back and forth. How much is this? Well... Unless you're a big damage dealer, on a, on a big hit, you'll do something like 10, 15, maybe 20 on like a big hit. Those, those are pretty uh, decent amounts of damage early on. So, you know, you're not doing as much, but it's an area effect. So you're hitting a lot of people at the same time. So in a big group, this can add up to a lot of hit points. And if nothing else, it just increases your overall damage per second. I think it's quite cool. And then we've got at the sight of their comrades, their hearts grew bold, which gives a friendly aura of fortitude and will defense, which is going to be sort of if you used blessed was whatever over here, plus that one, then all of our defenses would be boosted except deflection plus the movement speed. So you alternate those two. But not only that, when you've cycled through your chant three times, you can fire off an invocation so, well, it depends. They have different phrases. So, um, but Rennie Derrett's ghost, he would not rest. You have to have spoken three phrases. And then you, when you cast this, you actually summon a phantom. This one here is a faux AoE, which gives them a, um, a penalty to their damage reduction for 12 seconds. So for 12 seconds, they will be a lot more vulnerable to damage. If their bones still slept under that hill, none can say. Someone's three skeletons. Not felled by the axe, not broken by the sword, is a gives your own allies increased damage reduction. This one here does a lightning-based attack in a cone. Um, this one does a... Oh no, this, my bad. This one is a crushing attack in a cone and can push them and stun them. 
This one was the lightning one, um, which just does damage, but so while this one does, they both basically do the same damage, and this one's got the push and the stun, this one has a length of 2.5 meters, whereas this one has a length of 3 meters. And this one is really weird, because it's a huge length, but you have to target a downed enemy, which then explodes into like doing a fair bit of damage, uh, which is quite cool. Um, but might be a little harder to use. So you're using, you're doing this sort of, um, you're, you're a spellcaster. And I gotta say, like, these do, like, big damage. Um, especially if you boost your own might. You can do some pretty impressive damage with that. And the chants are just awesome. I like the chanter. Very cool class. Okay, Druid. Druid is a divine spellcaster, very similar to a priest. You've got some area of effect damage spells. You've got some heals, some crowd controls, all kinds of stuff like that. But the big thing, of course, as a Druid is the ability to shapeshift into an animal. Now... All of these shapeshifts, they, they've got a description, There's, you know, they don't really give you any, any kind of numbers here. All of these are very similar, okay? They all have, when you shapeshift into them, like in, if you watch my mechanics demo, they will all use claws, so their equipment gets replaced. They will use claws instead of weapons. The claws do really, really nice damage, whereas a longsword will do something like, uh, I think it's something like around 10 to 15, a, a normal longsword at the start. Your claws will do something like, 20 to 25, or no, it's 16 to 25 damage is the range on the claws. They have average speed, so they are, the claws are generally speaking, better than a weapon that you're going to start with. You're also dual wielding the claws, which is very sexy. Not only are you wielding better than average weapons, but your armor is awesome. If you watch my mechanics video, you know that when you're wearing armor, armor doesn't reduce the chance that you'll get hit, it just reduces the amount of damage you take, gives you damage reduction. For every point of damage reduction that your armor gives you, you generally have a 5% penalty to your recovery speed between attacks and spells. So very heavy armor means a very long time between attacks or between spell casts. When you're in your animal form, you will get a damage reduction of 8 with no recovery speed. That's like, that's wearing very heavy armor. That is like, you are tough and tanky, but your recovery speed is not affected, which means you're going to be attacking pretty damn quickly. Now, this, for example, this stag here, it says you have higher defense. As far as I can tell, you don't have any higher defense than cat or boar or anything like that. Um, all the forms have the default damage of the claws that do 16 to 25 with an average speed. The boar is one exception because his attack also inflicts damage over time. He does an extra 20% damage over time, which is pretty good. All of these forms have a hide that's got a damage reduction of 8, except for the bear, which has a damage reduction of 10. Additionally to that, some of these forms have an extra special ability. The bear has the ability to roar and frighten people, which decreases their accuracy. Um, the boar doesn't have any activatable abilities, but actually regenerates endurance over time, so he regenerates on his own. Very, very cool. The cat, despite the description, um, seems to be very generic, except has an ability that increases its attack speed by, I think, 33% for like 12 seconds. So it's like a once, um, that attack speed boost is once per rest. So once per rest, you can go really crazy. It's possible that as you level up the druid, you will get talents that will allow you to further specialize your forms. I don't know. Maybe the cat becomes faster and faster and faster as you continue to go up and unlock more talents. I haven't explored that part of the game yet. The stag has this carnage attack that does splash damage, very much like the barbarian, and the wolf has the ability to knock people down. Um, so each of the form is going to be relatively similar. I will note that you don't actually tra um, transform into an actual cat or an actual wolf. It's more like a werewolfy kind of form for all of them. So as a stag, you turn into a larger version of yourself with antlers, for example, and you know fur all over, that sort of thing. I think the cat, the wolf look pretty cool. Um, actually, they all look pretty decent now that I think about it. In addition to that, as a druid, you get a variety of spells. You do not, unlike the wizard, um, you don't have to have a grimoire. You have access to all your spells all the time. And some of them are really powerful. I gotta say, I think the druid might be one of my favorite classes. And again, when you make your druid, you have to choose exactly how you're going to build it. And there's a lot of incentive to do different things. With a high might, as a druid, you can be a massive damage dealer. You go high might, maybe even just put in a bunch of constitution. And just like, your, your move in fight will just be like, I go to bear form and smash everything. It's worth noting, you can cast all your spells in animal forms, and you can transform into your animal form every single fight, every single encounter. So, really potent set of abilities. Monks! Alright, classic unarmed fighters. Your unarmed attacks do bonus damage compared to everyone else. Furthermore, as you take more damage, 
As you get damage, you will generate these things called wounds, and these wounds are used to power some of your special attacks. You start with really, really good base stats. Really good base stats as a monk. I haven't actually played a monk myself, though. Um, and you can pick a starting ability here, so your swift strikes requires you to expend a wound, so you have to take hits. But then if you kick, get... Take, if you get hit and you kick one of those wounds, you can trigger your swift strikes. You get 25% faster attack speed for 10 seconds. It's pretty good. Torment's Reach is a cone-based attack. Oh, this is very much like the Cypher attack, where you target, I think, one person to do damage and then does a cone behind them or something like that. Again, I haven't tested out the monk, so I can't really comment on that. You'll notice the stars here, where it recommends certain stats that are particularly important uh, for your different... Um, classes but you know you're free to ignore those if you want to do something a little bit different all right the priest relatively squishy poor combat stats definitely um you have spell casting like the druid you don't have to memorize a particular set of spells um you gain you basically can cast any of your spells anytime although you have a certain number of castings per day it starts you know like two or three castings of your first level spells for example between rests um they've got a holy radiance ability like the paladin they have to choose a deity which gives them a certain type of favored disposition and disfavored disposition. The better you are towards your favored disposition, the more powerful your Holy Radiance will be. You turn it on, it heals your allies, which is pretty good, and any enemy vessels, which is a particular type of enemy, will take burn damage and may be frightened. And yeah, as you um, affect your reputation, your, your Holy Radiance power will shift. Finally, we've got the rogue over here. The rogue always has a sneak attack ability, so if anyone is blinded, flanked, hobbled, paralyzed, petrified, prone, stuck, stunned, or weakened, basically anything that is a debuff on your opponent almost, um, they will do bonus damage via sneak attack. So it's really nice to combo a rogue with a fighter that's got the knockdown ability, or a druid that's a wolf that can knock people over, or there's a variety of different abilities like that. It's worth noting that the rogue also gets the ability to get a special ability like blinding strike or crippling strike, Crippling Strike hobbles people, Blinding Strike blinds them. Both of these will also be sufficient to activate your sneak attack bonus, so that's pretty good. Um, it's also worth noting that the um, the Blinding Strike also just does bonus damage by itself and might blind them. Crippling Strike, same thing, bonus damage by itself and it might hobble them, for example. I quite like the Blinding Strike. Um, blind gives them a big penalty to accuracy, huge penalty to accuracy, which is really nice. Um, and reduces their deflection as well, so they keep being easier to hit. Big fan of Blinding Strike. So those are all the classes. Um, let's go and uh, pick one of these. Let's go with the rogue. Why not? We'll give him blinding strike over here. And again, those statistics. So you can see the stars are the recommendations. Here they're saying, you know, hey, have a high dexterity, presumably for very fast action speed more than anything else. Um, so you can hit more frequently. Have a high might because might increases your damage and you are, your role is to be a damage dealer. But note as they also recommend, hey, perception isn't bad because perception increases the rate that you interrupt people. And intellect is also pretty good because it'll increase the duration of your debuffs. You'll be blinding people a little bit longer. One very tempting thing to do as a rogue might be to actually lower the rogue's damage output. We go with high dexterity for fast action speed, comboed with high perception for high interrupt, and you try to keep people locked down as much as possible. That, that might be a very cool thing to do. Um, it's also, so we have to pick a culture over here. Um, every, every character will also get to pick a culture, which might affect some of their backstory, in addition to changing their starting gear a little bit, and gives them an extra stat. So if we go with the Deadfire Archipelago, we'll get a plus one to the dexterity. Plus, you know, history. Hey, pirates. Cool. I like pirates. You also get to pick a background. This is true for absolutely everyone. Background will give you a little bit of a bonus to a skill. So I should talk about the different skills at this point. We've got Lore over here. Lore lets you um, activate scrolls and might spot some extra stuff. It comes up a lot in conversations as well. Having a high Lore will sometimes let you uh, use different options in conversation. Explorer has the Lore and Survival. Survival lets you make better use of food and potion items. They find higher a character's survival skill the longer duration of such items. So food will do something like for 180 seconds, so it's quite long. I don't think you can use food in combat, but you can use that of combat for a pretty long duration buff, relatively speaking. You know, for, for the next 180 seconds, you will get um, you'll get plus one damage reduction. That's what beer does, for example. I don't know what the duration is, but yeah, you're like plus one damage reduction because you're drunk, you feel slightly less pain. So with higher survival, those items will last longer, which is cool. Mechanics are what allow you to um, disarm traps 
find and disarm traps, which is quite cool. Sometimes you can place your own traps, and again, sometimes there'll be some interactions that come up. Athletics is pretty good for everyone because it will decrease the amount of fatigue that you get from doing stuff. Your characters can get fatigued if they're awake for too long, if they do too much fighting. Some scripted interactions can also use up some fatigue, and fatigue will give you a debuff, uh, some sort of major penalty to combat, uh, which will only be cleared up by resting. Also, there's plenty of scripting um, interactions there. Um, is that all of them? Oh, and stealth! Stealth is very good. If you hit alt, you will to toggle your entire party into stealth mode. They will move a little bit slower, they will be harder to detect, they'll also be able to... Um, the, it, it, stealth mode is also, it's just scouting mode as well, so it increases the chance that you will spot something as well. So, uh, stealth is a really good thing if you do want to use a scout to kind of move ahead, have someone with very, very high stealth. Um, and sometimes you might want your whole party to be relatively stealthy as well. Um, I, don't, I don't think there's a stealth-based sneak attack, for example, but it is, you think of stealth mostly as a scouting mode. Helps you spot things without being spotted back, for example. So we can pick one of those, we'll go with Raider, why not? So your appearance over here, uh, because we picked a female character, we have no facial hair to choose from. This uh, human model comes with four different heads that we can choose from. Over here, again, we picked the Metal Folk, so that locks in some of our look over here. Quite a few different hair options, some big ones, some quite cool ones over here. Uh, what's next after that? Oh, your appearance. This is your character portrait that you can have. Quite a bit of variation. Um, this 66 list, I think, includes all um, races and genders, though. Yeah, so we're in sort of the dudes over here. Some elves we're going by there, for example. Obviously, these would be the, the godlikes, and so on and so forth. And then into the female portraits over here. So you can pick and choose. There's a way for you to bring in your own portraits into the game as well. I think there's a folder. You can just drop an image in there. So if you've got a really good custom image that you want to use, you can go ahead and do that. Um, I think that's it. Next thing will be picking a voice. Hmm. I shall lead us. <laughs> Time to see and not be seen. Hmm. I've got this. Uh. Easy now. Hmm. Leading the way. Charge! Sharp eyes and keen ears. Hmm? Leading the way. Ugh. They won't see me coming. Or no voice whatsoever if you now prefer that. I am leader of the group. And then you put in their character name. Um, you know. Uh, someone. <laughs> Quilia. Like that. Um, if we change race at this point, we can tune things. I can go from my human ocean folk, for example, over here. And then we can go back into the appearance if we want to tweak that. Take a look at some of the different head shapes. Um, you can change skin color. Uh, the second or the hair color. That's kind of cool. And then the secondary and primary colors for their gear, for example, here. You can see I'm changing the sort of undershirt color. Right? So we'll leave it uh, red so it's nice and visible. And then the secondary color over here looks like that'll be mostly her pants right there. So depend on what kind of armor they're wearing, it'll uh, maybe affect some different types of characteristics there, but you can, you know, tune your experience a, a little wee bit. Um, I think that covers everything that I want to look at. We can, uh, oh, we should look at the godlikes actually. Um, maybe like the moon godlike over here, and then go back to the appearance and switch the heads around. Can't change the hair on the uh, the godlikes because the head shape sort of defines that. That's, that's quite cool. My hair is two eagles. Your argument is invalid. Uh, look at the male characters over here. Appearance. I think the heads are relatively same-ish. Eh, not quite, actually. Um, let's take a look at the Death God likes. They're, like, real weird. Really weird in the head. Uh, like, what the hell is going on there? I don't know. The Fire God likes are pretty cool. All right. And they do look quite different from one another. So there you have it. Um... Did I look at their traits? I think I looked at the godlike traits. Yeah, 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 the Battle Forge and, and whatnot, which I think is a, is a great trait. So um, lots of options in the character creator. Um, as I mentioned, I think in the mechanics thing, your ultimate party size, you can have up to six people in your group. There are um, NPCs in the world, non-player characters, that you can have join your party. I think there's something like eight of them that are completely fleshed out with backstories, voice acting, all that kind of stuff. But also, once you're in the game, you can go to an inn, and there's an option at the end to... Um, recruit or hire an adventurer which basically just drops you back into the character creation process and you can have a party of six custom created characters if you want to you know fine-tune exactly your party composition you can do that um, I will probably be doing that at least a little bit especially early on before I find all the possible non-player characters who can join the uh, the party um, but ultimately I quite like the uh, the ones you find in game generally speaking because uh, usually they'll have more interesting backstory and interactions and that sort of thing but um, there you have it 
lots of options, potentially a lot of replay options, especially if you decide to go through the game with different personalities, you know, be more or less cruel, for example, um, and the different classes will give you a pretty decent feel. A lot of them feel very, 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 very good. On um, my first test playthrough, I was playing the Cypher, which at that time felt a little bit weak, but I think it's because I didn't really understand the game. Also, I don't think I did a very good job with the stats. On my second little test, I was playing a little bit as a druid, and I was like, oh my god, this is so much more powerful. But again, on the second playthrough, you sort of know what you're doing, so it sort of by default feels a little bit easier. We'll see how it goes. I, I'm always, like, I'm always confused about what to do, um, because, like, I like playing spellcasters, but at the same time, you often find so much cool gear in the world that playing a, a fighter that can use, like, the awesome mega magic sword also feels pretty badass, so um, I haven't really decided yet. Let me know in the comments what you decide to do, and of course, as always, likes and favorites and subscribes and all those things makes a huge difference for the channel, um, and if you can share this with any friends, please do. Looking forward to the game. Uh, stay tuned. We'll be starting a Let's Play relatively soon. See you next time, folks. Bye-bye.